Welcome to the New Trust Economy, where your hosts, Blockchain 101 author and founder of Rise Housing, Monica Profit, and Inc. innovation columnist and brand casting strategist, Tracy Hazard, explore all things blockchain, ICO ventures, and cryptocurrency. Each week, they explore businesses, applications, and venture built on blockchain or cryptocurrency and address issues like women and diversity in tech, trust and distrust, and the economics of access and value. We would like to remind our listeners that investing in disruptive tech, ICOs, and cryptocurrency is speculative in nature and involves substantial risk of loss. We encourage you to invest carefully and do your due diligence first. Now, here's today's host, Tracy Hazard. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the New Trust Economy. I'm Tracy Hazard, and I have a really cool and interesting company to some people. It might be a little geeky for others. It might be a little too in the financial tech weeds because we're going to be talking tax accounting. Doesn't that sound like a lot of fun? Well, actually it is. And I really love the two guys that I'm talking to today, Jared Zemp and Seth Wilkes. Both of them have such passion for what they're doing here and they're bridging a really great gap in the fintech area for blockchain and cryptocurrency. And so I'm super excited to bring them to you. Let me tell you a little bit about Jared Zemp is a serial fintech edtech entrepreneur. He's a seasoned executive and a veteran educator. He currently serves as executive vice president of revenue and investor relations for ProfitStamp, a cryptocurrency tax accounting platform for tax professionals and individuals. I'm profit stance. We're going to talk a lot about that today, but they're filling a very cool gap in the accounting resolution area. So we're going to talk about that too. He holds a degree in business from Brigham Young University and is a member of the faculty at LDS Business Colleges. He has six kids and a pug, and most of his free time is spent cleaning something icky off of his shoes. I met him in Utah, and we had a lot of fun together. But this is the first time I'm getting to meet Seth Wilk, and he is a licensed CPA in Arizona and has worked both in the private and public accounting over the past 15 years. He has extensive experience in domestic, state, and local and international taxation. And he's helped companies expand their international operations around the world. And over the past two years, he's dedicated his time to researching taxation of virtual currencies. Doesn't that sound like something you want to do in your spare time? Research virtual currency taxation. I'm really glad somebody is actually doing this because when you all go to file your tax returns next year, you're all going to be thanking him. But he is the CFO and co-founder of Profit Stance, the leading cryptocurrency tax and accounting platform for professional advisors and crypto investors. So I'm really excited to bring you both Jared and Seth. Jared and Seth, thank you guys so much for being here today. I know it sounds weird to say I'm so excited to talk tax accounting. (laughs) Does that sound strange? Probably not to you guys, right? (laughs) It seems normal. (laughs) So I find fascinating about it though, is that there's so much, I guess, controversy around it. Like, should we be doing this? Is it this? Is it that? Like there's this whole controversy around crypto assets in general and cryptocurrency and taxation. So tell me a little bit about how you guys got started in this and what triggered you to start Profit Stance. Well, I think uh, first off, it should be noted, we actually aren't the ones who started it. Our founder, Corey, had originally got into crypto back in Oh, 2010, I think. He gave his friend 100 bucks and he got 900 Bitcoin. And then he promptly printed out his secret key, his private key, and ran it through the laundry and lost all 900 Bitcoin. <laughs> and at the time, it was like, and eh, no big deal, it's 100 bucks. But with forks and everything, it would have been worth some of the neighborhood of $20 million at this point. And, <laughs> He's uh, really so, kicking himself now. Yeah. <laughs> Right. <laughs> and I think that first experience kind of whet his appetite for the industry. And he started a mining operation with some investors. And when it came time for him to give reports to his investors, he realized there was no good way to do reporting. And then when it came time to pay taxes and try to figure out the taxes for the partnership, he realized there's no good way to do taxes. And so he put out feelers into the Twitter sphere, whatever that is. It turns out nobody else had a good way either. So he set out to set out to make it. What I found is that this, I think, holds us back, a lot of business owners back from having the cryptocurrency 
as a part of whether it's, I just take it as a part of my payment processing from my clients or something like that. It holds us back because we start thinking about the tax implications. Does this complicate my business more? Is it even worth it then at that point? So building something that makes that so streamlined and easy makes me not have to think about that, makes it more likely that I will adopt that in the future. That's a really good point, especially for businesses using crypto, because one of the major issues that we see right now is just lack of awareness, lack of compliance. And as long as people aren't compliant, aren't aware, then they keep spending their crypto, no big deal. But as awareness is increasing and compliance is increasing, people are realizing, well, wait a minute, every time I buy a cup of coffee, that's a taxable event. And I'm going to have to account for it at the end of the year. Imagine you have all these small transactions that that add up and make taxes just a nightmare at the end of the year. And we're afraid that that's going to result in much lower liquidity and add a real barrier to people using crypto on a daily basis. And so one of the real advantages of having a solid click of a button tax solution, they can really use their crypto without having to worry about the taxes at the end of the year. Yeah, and that actually applies on the business side too. So if you're if you're selling a cup of coffee and you accept Bitcoin as payment, you're accounting for thousands and thousands of these just micro transactions, and you have to track all that cost basis. And that by itself is a nightmare for business owners to even consider, and which has been a huge hurdle for people to really adopt accepting it. Yeah, it has been for me. Because, you know, when I set out to start this podcast with Monica and she and I were talking about it, I was like, well, why don't I just be the first podcast platform to accept Bitcoin or something like that? And we said, oh, this will be so easy. And the more I investigated, the more it was impossible for so many reasons. But taxation was just one of the many. But thinking about the timing of my transactional processing and all of that was not there either, which is starting to come up and, and be better right now, too. But you guys have really built a system that's pretty simple. Can you explain a little bit about how Profit Stance works? Yeah, it's really simple. So as an investor, you basically would come into our system, set up an account. You would then be able to link to most of your major exchanges and wallets through direct APIs so that you can pull all of your transactional details into one place. So you see all of your activity in one place. So it's very easy. And then from there, you know, in the back end, we compute all of the gains and losses, apply the proper accounting methods, and then actually fill out the forms for you. So the hardest thing for you to do is just connect your exchanges and wallets and pull those things into your account. Yes, absolutely. That's like the complicated side on that that end. And that still seems fairly simple in your process. Yep. Very simple. We actually had some conversations where uh, we built the tool and we tried it out and uh, we decided it looked too easy. We need graphs and we need more buttons or something so that people understand that they're paying for something of value. Like they, they put it in, it's so simple, they hit a button and we give them a PDF with their tax form and it's two and a half minutes and we're like, no, 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 it's got to look harder. Can't put it on more people. <laughs> It's got to look more more complex, right? Yeah. Thinking about the manual side of that is, and that is incredibly difficult. So, you know, I used to have to track all of this on the product side of things, what we call royalties, right? And tracking royalties. And we would have to track all kinds of shipments and all kinds of levels and the royalties would shift over time. And, And I can tell you that was just absolute auditing nightmares for me to even tell if I was paid properly, let alone if I was accounting for it properly on the, on the taxation side. And that was real money. It was my salary, essentially, at the end of the day. So I had to account for it. So I think there's a lot of noncompliance going on because they don't think of it. They think no one's going to know and it's not going to happen. But when we get into business side of it, we have to account for it because it is part of our revenue. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've been a CPA for almost 15 years now. Okay, so part of our process of testing our system is I actually have to go through and manually calculate some of these things. So I'm literally pulling in, I mean, we're not, we're not talking about thousands of transactions. We're talking about 50 to hundred transactions across two exchanges. Okay. So not a complicated scenario. It still takes me anywhere from 20 to 40 hours to go through and manually calculate that. And if you think that I'm going to bill $200 an hour to find out that you have what a $2,000 capital gain, 
It just doesn't make any sense. So there's no way you can go to your professional tax advisor and expect them to put in that kind of time because it's nobody can afford it. It's just not worth it for anyone. No, I can completely see that. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) to accountants and they say, yeah, it doesn't make sense for me to do it. So I just push it back on them. I tell them, you get all this worked out. You just tell me the final number and I'll put it in. And if it's that tough for Seth, who's been doing it for years, <laughs> you know, and has a degree in this and has had a career in tax, uh, imagine it's just not realistic to expect your, your average consumer to go home and calculate their own taxes and come back with one final number, you know, it's kind of ridiculous. And that's where we play. So, you know, there's a lot of, I'm going to call it infrastructure issues, right? There's a lot of that going on in the crypto space. So it's a lack of infrastructure. It's a lack of connection. It's a lack of understanding. Like, I mean, as I was saying before, like I just went to go try to take Bitcoin and couldn't integrate it in with my system of how much, how speed of transactions. So my website would time out. Like, I mean, there's just all of these little missing pieces all over the place. What are you guys seeing in terms of that in infrastructure problems with the sort of taxation side of everything? You're exactly right. So I think the easiest thing to think about is think about securities, okay? When you buy and sell stocks, you're going through your brokerage account. At the end of the year, you get a report. It's really easy. It summarizes all of your gains and losses. And then you can take that, plug it directly to TurboTax or give it to your CPA. And you don't really have to think about it. The other thing to think about is that if you decide you want to transfer one of your stocks, one brokerage account to another brokerage account, there are rules in place that require them to send all of the historic information. So what did you buy it for originally? When did you buy it? So that just gets sent automatically. None of that type of infrastructure or reporting exists within the crypto space. I mean, so it's all on you where you buy Bitcoin. Go ahead. So yeah, it's all on yeah. you to like do yeah, it. That sure, seems right? crazy. <laughs> so. yeah, if you have an advanced degree in finance and have a week that you can dedicate to figuring out, <laughs> awesome. Good luck. <laughs> I joke on the show that I, and I've done another episode on tax. Like I am kind of a tax geek, which is really funny because I'm an, I, I have an art degree. So like both Monica and I actually have art degrees, right? Design degrees. <laughs> and yet I care about the numbers. So I fired. Over the years, I've fired four tax attorneys in four years and our tax accountants in four years. So I'm tough on people. So I'm sure you don't want me as your client, Seth. But the reason is, is because they aren't oh, keeping awesome. up on okay. this, right? Well, that's actually a big part of the way we approach the market because, you know, we really have two, um, two ways we go to market. We have a tool that's built for professionals. So these are professional tax preparers who are, you know, have clients with crypto. And then we have an individual. Tool, so somebody can come directly to us and work with us. But what's really happening is that there's a huge lack of education. So you fired four, four tax accountants over the last several years. Well, what we're seeing and we're out there talking to CPAs is that these guys don't even know that there's a problem. We're trying to tell them that we have a solution to a problem they don't even know exists. And so what, right. a lot of what we're doing is webinar, trying to educate as many people as possible that, hey, this is a thing you need to be prepared because when you have a client that comes to you, you need to be able to speak their language and understand what. Yeah, you know, that is a huge issue. Language is the big issue that I find. And that's where I, why I fired so many because it was that language over royalty, right? Like they didn't understand it. And one of them caught me in a situation where I ended up paying taxes twice on the same money. And so, because it was deferred royalty, I was pissed. So you get into this situation of not understanding the new language, but not understanding what's missing. So we were talking before about gross proceeds and cost basis and just the requirements that this isn't being tracked. Yeah, it's very simple. If you just think think of it, you buy Bitcoin for $100 on Coinbase. You hold it for six months and now it's worth $150. And you decide you want to transfer it to your cracking account. So you send it over. And let's say at the end of the year that you know, Coinbase actually reports your gross proceeds and cost basis. But what do they really report? That you had $150 of gross proceeds because when that Bitcoin left, that's with fair value. Because Coinbase has no idea that you just sent it to Kraken, right? To your own exchange. So that's not a taxable transaction, but Coinbase doesn't know it. On the other side, Kraken, they only know what the fair value was when they received it. So again, like, 
that's just one tiny transaction. Now you multiply that thousands of times across multiple years, and the whole thing just blows up. And the, that there's not infrastructure in place to support that kind of reporting. And so it all goes back to the individual. So, well, Trace, does the IRS even get it? Actually, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go over to Jerry. He's got a great example, but they they are getting it. Okay, so we've been actually working with the IRS for the last year and a half. Every time there's a new issue that the IRS wants to focus they, on, they, they create what they call a compliance campaign. There's a cryptocurrency compliance campaign, and their job is to analyze all things you know related to crypto best guidance, best way to audit it, like all, everything you can imagine the IRS does, that's the team that's supposed to figure it out. So we've actually been meeting with this team over the last year and a half to talk to them about what we're doing, the information we're hearing from the, from the industry, from clients, and you know, they're sharing with us what they're doing and they are getting it. But the problem is they still don't see a solution that can address the problem. I mean, they can go out and force regulations, but the exchanger are coming back and saying, we don't have the technology built in to do what you want us to do. Yeah. That's a huge problem. <laughs> so, uh, so, so Jared, what were you going to so say? He has a <laughs> let, let, Go ahead. Yeah. I, I've been talking a lot. I'm like supposed to be the introvert here. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we have a client named a nasty letter from us a few months ago that said, hey, you owe us $150,000. Long story short, he came to us and said, what do I do? And we said, well, let's take a look. It turns out we run it through our software. He actually only owed 1500 So by properly correlating his transactions between accounts, it reduced his tax bill by 140 grand. That's a pretty big issue. Scott turns around and says, hey, I just filed based on, on my reports that I got from the exchanges. It's the exchanges' fault. They gave me bad information. And the exchanges then say, well, wait a minute. No, we know it's bad information, but this is what the IRS makes us do. So it's the IRS's fault. So we went straight to the IRS and said, hey, what's going on? And, and why is this? Why is it this way? And the long and the short of it is that, that if we're actually going to be able to compare notes, you know, exchanges between accounts, not just between Coinbase and Kraken, but between your exchanges and your wallets, or uh, if on a chain, all that stuff is difficult to coordinate, to correlate. And that's where there needs to be a disinterested third party that can work with all the stakeholders and uh, pull that information and correlate it. And that's what we're proposing to the IRS is that we can come in and we can help with that correlation and be that kind of middle layer, that enabling horizontal layer across the different technologies and across the different exchanges and wallets so that they can correlate the transactions. And that makes all the difference in the world. I mean, for Scott, it made $142,500 difference. He's very interested. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. I would be very excited if I was that client of yours. So <laughs> being able to prove that and very quickly. So I love that. So you were mentioned before that you've been in DC a lot. You've been talking with the what's going on in terms of virtual currency regulations and other things. What are you seeing? What are you seeing you think is going to be coming forward? So the thing that I think definitely is on the horizon is going to be information reporting. You know, essentially, there, there's a code section. I, I won't bore you with de details of numbers and things like that. But essentially, the, the, the Secretary of the Treasury already has the to designate cryptocurrencies as what they call a specified security. And once they designate that, then they fall under the same gross, um, gross proceeds and cost basis reporting that securities fall in. And so as soon as that happens, the exchanges and wallets and anybody who's designated as, as an exchange will have to start that reporting. But truly, the, the technology doesn't exist. Like, they're not being insincere when they say that. I'm aware of a, of a meeting with the Blockchain Association and, and Treasury that took place a few weeks ago. And they essentially, you know, it was, a, it was their first meeting together. And essentially, they were just getting to know each other, right? But... What they walked away saying is, hey, we want to provide information reporting, but we don't have the technology and we can't do it. And what we're talking with the IRS and the Treasury Department and Capitol Hill about is, hey, 
we think that there can be a solution. We think that there's an infrastructure that can be built underneath all of these transactions to track that metadata, to create that reporting so that you don't have to, you know, as an individual, you don't have to compile thousands of lines of a spreadsheet and figure out what your gains and losses are. You should just get a form like you do a 1099-V and plug it in your tax return and go on your way. Yeah. Oh, that sounds ideal. I love that. Are you, Jared, especially, you've been in fintech for quite some time. You've been a serial fintech entrepreneur. Are you seeing that there's a lot more adoption going on of crypto assets, blockchain technology? Are you seeing that like a tipping point in, in what's going on in business? You know, the tipping point that I really kept my thumb on is that is the, the internet, and we talked about it a little before the show, fractional ownership, larger assets. My career has been in private equity, dealing with micro cap company. And what we're finding is that with the Jobs Act creating the uh, Reg CF fundraising and the Reg A plus fundraising, and then the advent of all this, the blockchain and cryptocurrencies, these things are all coming together and playing a major role in helping your average Joe to be able to own a piece of Main Street America. It's taking what only happened on the New York Stock Exchange, on large stock exchange for for hundreds of thousands or for millions of dollars just in filing fees, and it's bringing it down to your average investor and saying, hey, you can start a company and you create your own coin, you can create uh, your own stock, you can do a Reg A plus filing, and you've you've essentially gone public for $50,000 instead instead of 200,000 to 2 million dollars in filing. And so we're re- really seeing kind of a democratization of ownership. And you can imagine that's creating all sorts of, of questions around regulatory and you know, regulators are sitting back and saying, we really don't want to step in. We really want industry to regulate itself as much as possible. And so it's not just that they're government employees. They actually are hoping that industry will regulate themselves to some degree. And that's really what we're talking about here is helping exchanges report better to their clients and helping clients report better to the IRS so the IRS doesn't have to come down with a big stick. Right. It just makes it streamlined and simple and we're all, this is a big problem. So over in another side of business that I've worked in is complexities of sales tax calculations for Amazon sellers, for instance. And it's an absolute nightmare at this low level of it. So they just don't comply, right? And so we've been seeing all these rulings going on in all the different yeah. states. With the, I'm sure you've been dealing with that on the accounting side, right? And so you see all of that happening because there is no choice but to start regulating. But it's not really the problem is, is the system's too complicated. How am I supposed to register with every single one of those states? And I'm supposed to say, I'm sorry, but I refuse to take... Alabama as a state because I can't figure out how to get into the, you know, into their registry. Like it, you just can't do that in the system. And so that's where we see non-compliance happen. So having something that what I call is, a, this is what I love is businesses that are bridges. So you're bridging where things are today and where you would like them to be. You're more likely to hit a compliance level than you are by regulating that. Yeah. The truth of the matter, too, is that I think there's a lot of people still on the sideline, both both from a business standpoint and from an investor standpoint, who are interested in getting into this market, but they don't see the infrastructure in place yet. They don't know that they're going to be able to get adequate reporting. They're, they're worried about getting hacked. Like There's all kinds of fears. That they're in that wait and see right? mode, right? <laughs> yeah, so I think the regulatory part is, is a really big part. So I think that you know, a lot of people view regulation as a bad thing. I think smart regulation in, in this instance will actually really grow the virtual currency and blockchain markets. And so I think it's one of those things that has to happen before we really get mass adoption. But I think the system that we're talking about really could enable that type of adoption. And we're, we're incredibly excited about it. I can hear that and I can see that. Yeah, you guys are excited yeah. about it. And you've got me excited about it too. So I want to make sure that our listeners and ours out there can understand that you can use this today, right? They can try it. This is not in beta. You, you have it available for them to utilize. Yeah, it is available. The full production launch is actually January 1. We've gone through beta. We now it's in the hands of our product advisory board. 
the, our nationwide PR campaign hits first week in January, and and we do a full rollout at that point. So perfect yeah, anybody, time for 2020 taxes, in, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we've been in conversations with uh, other foreign governments. We've been in conversations with with several of the big four tax accounting firms, a number of regional firms, and this is an industry wide problem that hasn't found a solution yet. And so every time we open that door, we find uh, it's it's not difficult to get the meetings because everyone's looking for the solution. Many have tried to build their own solution and or have cobbled together kind of a a Frankenstein approach with different tools available online. And there just really isn't a good, smooth, in the door and then out to the IRS solution yet. So we're really excited. We've been working closely with consumers and with accountants to make sure that what we're turning out here is a real top to bottom approach to how to get this done the right way. Well, is there anything else you would like us to know about Profit Stance or what you're doing in the marketplace or what's going on in Washington? You know, it's actually interesting because a lot of what's going on in Washington, you know, we were there, was it October? Just last yeah, month, right? Two weeks ago. And, you know, we met with several members of Capitol Hill, Congress. We met with the IRS and Treasury. And from the Capitol Hill standpoint, especially if you're talking to like the Democrats, they're really concerned about consumer protection anti-money laundering, you know, fraud, these kinds of things that kind of protect the individual. Whereas the on the Republican side, it seems like they're really interested in encouraging industry to find a solution rather than overbearing regulation, which, you know, obviously fits into typical what you would expect. But I think in this case, they're both right. And they're like, both I aligned with are, finding a solution, right? I know, miracle of miracles, right? <laughs> <laughs> who who would have thought that maybe crypto uh, is going to align the aisles? In, in <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Kind of thing. Um, <laughs> innovation is another big one. Where a few years ago we saw kind of a mass exodus talent to foreign countries, so they could work on blockchain, and that's still an issue because yeah. there's a lot of regulation here in the U.S. that doesn't apply globally, and so there's innovation happening on exchanges and with coins outside the U.S. that uh, we don't have access to here. And so that's a concern for policymakers too. But the number one thing that they all asked for was more education. Can you teach us more? Can we reach out with questions? Can you talk to my legislative advisors, my legislative director? Tell me, uh, educate me on this because there's, I feel like changing every single day and I just can't keep up. And that's true. And the, and the people we were talking to, many of them are on the blockchain caucus. So these are players who understand the space pretty well. Okay. But the question they ask us is, how do we educate our other colleagues? Democrats want to, you know, they wanted to educate other Democrats because they want to get them on board. And the Republicans, same thing. So the guys on the blockchain caucus, they're pretty good. They get it. But I think that they are still having a hard time educating everybody else. And so they're asking industry, hey, how do we do this? And so, you know, that's another, we're actually developing a uh, you know, crypto in 24 minutes course for policymakers so that they can get a better idea of what blockchain is, what virtual currencies are. Understand that this is not something that is, not everything is Silk Road. There's a lot of wonderful technologies yeah. out there that are based on, on this. And, you know, this is where the future is going. I want to stop apologizing and saying, you know, I'm building something on the blockchain, but it's not crypto. Like I want to stop apologizing for that and say, it is fractional. I expect that it's going to be security, but it's not crypto. Like you want to have that explanation going on there too. Someday we are educated enough to understand that there are differences in what's going on in the marketplace. Yeah. I mean, and that's a great example. It, It just shows that even though, you know, Bitcoin has been around since, you know, over a decade now, it truly is still so new in the sense of people are just caring about it. And that education part is just so important. We can't stress that enough in, in our marketing efforts and helping people understand just the general market. Well, and I'm really curious as to see in the future. So this is one of the things. So it's no secret to my listeners and my viewers out there that I'm curious in this because I want to build a part of my podcast production house my network that I have here. I want to build it on a blockchain because I want to allow fractional ownership. But what's holding me back are so many complex 
things and, and so many structures that I would have to build in. And it's not just software and building in the blockchain itself. It's how do I account for this at the end yeah. of the day? Do I have to issue K1s to everybody? Like, and how do I do that in an automated and simple way? Like, you know, it's not without this tremendous burden to an organization to try to do something cool sounds great, but logistically, if you can't accomplish it, then what good does it do anyone? And then I just make their lives nightmare by having issued this thing that they don't know what to do with. So it's not helping anyone in the process, as cool as it sounds, right? And that's what holds us back from application and adopting what would be an amazing change and shift in an industry or innovation, as you put it. It holds it back. Yeah. And what you see, I mean, you're mirroring, mirroring exactly what's happening in the government side because the SEC wants to treat it one way. The IRS wants to treat it one way. The CFTC wants to treat it a different way. I mean, nobody is on the same page yet. And so how, as a business owner, how are you going to know, how can I issue a coin? And yes, I do want it to have actually be ownership in my network. And then how do I comply with that? And what kind of disclosures do I need to go through? Like, there's got to be a clear set of rules. Jared alluded to this earlier. It can't be some process that costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars like an IPO would cost you. It's got to be you know, something that allows the small business owner to be able to kind of catapult into business and allow that kind of ownership. And that's, you know, Jared said it before too, the fractional ownership. That's such a huge thing to let, you know, the everyday investor own a piece of Main Street. It's so great. I think there's tremendous value. It's, it's honestly, there were two parts of blockchain that excited me and it was Steve Wozniak that excited me the first time about it. And that was the idea of creative value being maintained through a smart contract, through all of that. Because as I mentioned before, I got a lot of my value and my business came from royalties, but collections was a nightmare. And so cre creating a, a smart contract and related value, like that would have been, would have made it so easy for me to do a lot more business and help a lot more companies if that could have been maintained for me. Instead, I was like, I'm done with this. I'm going to move into a different marketplace. And so that's a shame as well, right? So you look at that from one side, but the other side of it is that I have creators on my platform and I want to reward them because I want to operate my business differently. I want to operate it with that creative and innovation value. And yet I can't do it because the system's too complex and the reporting's not there. And all of my podcasters at the end of the day would, was like, please opt me out because I don't want to deal with this on my tax side. Like that would be terrible if that was the net result, right? So we do have to, this is where a lot of us are wait and see, and we're sitting in this position. So bridge builders like you guys at Profit Stance, what you're doing there and, and building that bridge between where things are today and where things want to be in the future, that's an essential part of the growth of any innovative, disruptive industry. Tracy, I heard a really interesting podcast the other day, and I've, I've listened to too many, I can't remember which it was, but they basically alluded to the idea that smart contracts thrive in environments where trust is difficult. And they said, you know what, the, the irony is that this has kind of come full circle, that one of the areas where trust is so difficult is in drugs deals, drug deals and illicit arms trade. And they said, you know, they, instead of everyone showing up with guns and bombs and, and doing this big exchange that you always see in movies, really, you know, in the future, it'll just be done through a smart contract. <laughs> <laughs> And yet, Obviously, we're not trying to encourage the, the underground here, but I think when you're running a podcast called The New Trust Economy, I think that's exactly what we're talking about. Wherever trust has difficulty, that's where smart contracts thrive. And what's interesting to me is that trust is the biggest factor in the velocity of an economy. And if you can break down the trust barriers, then transactions happen so much faster and it has a real multiplier effect on the entire economy at large. And so not just the speed of a transaction, but breaking down trust barriers so that you can actually engage in a relationship and in a contract. I agree with you 100%. The trust economy is everything. As I was sitting here thinking, is you can't get a less magnification of distrust going on than between the IRS and businesses and, and individuals. So they desperately need something that has trust taken right out of the equation. And we just say, this is what it is. We got to trust that yeah. system, right? We got to trust that process. We got to trust the forms that are coming out because there's really no reason for us all to go into these details. Maybe that's our new slogan. <laughs> <Yeah>. Trustless taxes. 
<laughs> you know? It, it works. <laughs> don't, don't trust the IRS. <laughs> trust the <laughs> yeah. Well, I love it. Well, I thank you both for coming on today. I really appreciate it. And all of you listeners out there, make sure that you can connect to Profit Stance everywhere on social media as well as on their website um, and where they are. That will always be in the blog post at newtrusteconomy.com. And I will have also bios and information right there in the post as well on both Jared and Seth. And I look forward to bringing you a new episode where we explore the trust and we explore whether or not there should be trust, right? And explore new amazing blockchain and bridging technologies just like Profit Stance. So thank you all for listening. I'll be back next time with another New Trust Economy. You've been listening to The New Trust Economy. We'd love to hear your comments on today's show, as well as suggestions for future topics and guests. Visit us online at newtrusteconomy.com or on social at newtrusteconomy. Thanks for exploring The New Trust Economy with us.